Often, when the fish get scarce along the nearest coast, the ship captains organize fishing expeditions on the high seas that last between seven and 10 days. They use the same boats, but the conditions are much tougher. Eating, drinking, and sleeping inside the boat, at the mercy of the wind, and in danger of being run down by the commercial ships. Up until 1982, the fishermen received some aid. Then the aid changed hands, finally ending up in the hands of the nouveau riche, who have put together their own fleets with the subsidies. They have no experience. They don't respect contracts or the norms that have always ruled fishing. Only a small part of the fish that is produced on the traditional market is sold for export. The rest is sent in cars to the interior of the country. The cars used to transport the fish aren't exactly new. When a vehicle in Europe is deemed ready to be sold for parts, in Africa it has another 20 years of life. And when, after those 20 years have passed, it has drawn its last breath, recycling allows for its reincarnation as a cart, a coffee pot, or the nails to build ships. All those things that no longer work in Europe end up in Africa. Africans resuscitate objects, bringing them back to life with all the know-how and inventiveness that comes from necessity. It's the moment of the mechanic's magic. In Africa, everyone has an opinion. Only one person works, and the rest watch. But when the magic also fails, there is no other option but to turn to more traditional methods. As at sea, one person shouts, and the rest push. At dusk, all activity stops, and the universe of this city within a city dozes off in accordance with the day's rhythm. Tomorrow will not be another day. It will be the same. The same faces, the same difficulties, and the same will to survive. I've devoted my life to working with the men of the sea at Nouakchott Port and all along the coast. We will travel to the north of the country along the narrow corridor of sand and water that all vehicular traffic uses when the tides are low. Right now, and until the Algerian routes of Insala and Tamanrasset are opened again, this is the only road that connects North Africa with Sub-Saharan West Africa. I have lived and worked with various communities of traditional fishermen all along this coast. Most of them have been the sole inhabitants of these lands for centuries. The rest have come over the past few decades. Mohamed Levy is one of the many solitary fishermen who live and work along the Mauritanian coast. He is from Atar in the inland desert but his love of adventure and wide horizons made him leave the nomadic life 15 years ago, and he moved to the sea to live as a fisherman. His family, his wife and three children, live in Nouakchott. He spends two thirds of the year alone by the sea. Mohamed Levy does not know how to swim. He mostly fishes shark and manta ray, which he later sells to Madame Bamba. The shark fins go to Chinese merchants who export them to their country. I'm here to work, but my heart is in the country. I miss my family. But I go to Nouakchott two or three days each month to sell fish, and I see them there. I almost never go into the interior, but I do remember the desert sometimes. One can live with dignity here, but it is hard. 
It has its good and its bad moments. Sometimes whole weeks pass without a single catch, and other times I can't keep up with all the fish. There are no fixed rules. You have to be alert and wait for your chance. I spend hours watching the nets in the sea, looking for signs that the fish have decided to come near the shore. I don't receive any kind of aid. Around here, there are other fishermen who work like I do, and we support each other. We help each other. No one knows that we're here. Only God knows. The radio is the only way we have of staying in touch with the outside world. I listen to the news and to music. Music's what I enjoy the most. Towards the north, parallel to the coastline, the meeting of water and sand is even wilder, more violent, and dominated by a precise and brutal beauty. From Cape Timorist, one enters the so-called Arguin Bank, an area of shallows that occupy the former estuary of a dried up river. Since 1976, it has been a national park protecting the millions of birds that arrive each winter from places as far away as Europe or Siberia. It is a hard land facing a rich sea, and it is as fragile as a baby. A land whose human landscape has barely changed over the centuries. The Imragin, the only fishermen who have always lived along the Mauritanian coast must also navigate the contradictions of these modern times. They are protected by park laws, but these same laws also prevent them from joining the modern world. Ahmed Uma is one of the 88 in Ragen who live in Arguin Bank National Park. Today, as every morning, he has risen at sunrise to eke out his daily living. Fishing is the only way of life authorized by the park laws, and only under certain strict conditions. The first Portuguese navigators who explored around here spoke of the Imragen. Until very recently, the Imragen were slaves of the Gulatsbach, nomads dedicated to shepherding camels. The nomads weren't especially fond of fish, but they traded in it, dried and salted, and they transported it down to the south, where it was in greater demand. They were the first to trade with the Christians, also offering them ostrich feathers or gold in exchange for gunpowder. Times have changed, but the relationships are still similar. Most of the Gulatsbach have abandoned the nomadic life and now occupy privileged positions in the government or in the modern economy, while the Imragen continue in a subtle relationship of servitude towards their former masters. The fishing method used by the Imragen is very traditional. On the beach, the men look for a school of fish. They proceed with discretion, in silence, stalking their prey like true cats of the sea. The teams tend to be made up of six men. Three of them work in the water dragging the nets. The other three stay on shore. While some surround the fish, others beat the water driving them into the net. It must be a quick and coordinated action, perfectly timed so that the fish cannot escape, except into the nylon net. The Imragen have always fished this way from the shore. The use of boats with lateen sails is recent and was introduced by sailors from the Canary Islands at the end of the 19th century.
There is an ancient legend spread by the naturalist Jacques Cousteau, according to which dolphins help the Imragan make their catches. It's said that the men communicate with them in a secret language and that the dolphins follow their instructions and lead the fish into the nets. Unfortunately, it's only a legend. It's true that the fishermen often observe the dolphins to locate the large schools of fish, but that's all.